Mike Barker is the chief commercial officer at Hyas. He joined them at the end of 2022 and is leading a go-to-market transformation there. They've got solid products that have been around since 2015, and he's working on getting the go-to-market side aligned and operating smoothly to get the growth that they're after. In this episode, he talks about how he's aligning the go-to-market efforts with the idea of a marketing plumb line, how important and hard it is to differentiate in cybersecurity, but what they're actually doing to do that, uh, the first steps he took when he joined Hyas, and then he talks all about the sales team, how they're going to market, the types of sellers they have, and finally, he talks about whether he likes tea or coffee. And it's the first time I've heard the answer that he gave, so don't go away. Welcome to the Sales Bluebird podcast, where we help cybersecurity startups grow sales faster. I'm your host, Andrew Monahan. Our guest today is Mike Barker, Chief Commercial Officer at Hyas. Mike, welcome to Sales Bluebird. Thank you, Andrew. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation, as I do with all the conversations I have, but a couple of things that have uh, intrigued me about this one already, Mike, that we'll get on to. One is, you know, you joined the company recently, but in a role called Chief Commercial Officer. That's that's not a hugely common role, so I'm keen to understand more about what that's all about. Second thing that, uh, looking at your website, at Hyas's website, it seems like there's a bunch of products in there, and I'm keen to understand, you know, this difference between looking at a single product view, the go to market versus multiple products. Um, so I think there's probably something to, to tease out of that. Um, and then lastly, just as a kind of thing, you know, based on, the company's based out of Victoria in British Columbia, and I'm going to go out a limb here and say there's not that many cybersecurity companies headquartered officially out of uh, Victoria, BC. So I'm keen to understand a little bit more about that. So it's a kind of different angle uh, to maybe some of the interviews I've done, um, but with uh, really intriguing uh, things about how is doing about going to market right now. All right, well, let's look at your quick quick glance at your LinkedIn profile, LinkedIn experience here, Mike. So a uh, couple of highlights I pulled out of this. You started off in the in the Air Force as a computer operator back when probably computers were, were not that common. Um, so the fact that it was called a computer operator says a lot about uh, you know, what was going on at that time. And then you made the switch into the commercial world, went to cable and wireless. You were spent time with Juniper, Arbor, uh, Juniper again, and then Extreme Networks, uh, and then through to Cineverse, and uh, and right the way through to uh, Marketopia. I'm just reading out the names I see here. Upswat, and then Hias. It looks like a lot of your background was on the SE side or the pre-sales leadership side. Um, and then you made the switch halfway through and kind of took on more of a revenue generation leader type role. But all these roles are you know, head of global sales, uh, GM type roles, all the rest of it. A couple of things that did stand out for me, though, and I, I want to ask about these. I want to ask you, so you started off at the Extreme, and your role there was uh, the VP of global SEs. And I think you might have not made the right meeting or or taken a vacation or something because you you were you're appointed as a CIO at Extreme Networks. Uh, oh, wow. What happened that caused someone to lead to SE to then become the CIO? I love that question. It's actually one of my favorite questions. And um, interestingly enough, and most people um, who question this, you know, think, how, what did you do wrong? You know, how did how did you land into that role? And I'll tell you, it was actually by design. So as we built out the the global pre-sales engineering team, you know, I found myself, you know, of course, having an amazing team. I found what I spent most of my time doing was flying around the world, talking to our C-level customers, helping them have conversations with their board, helping them understand what was happening in the industry, and also just as important, helping them understand what their competitors were doing. And we were going through an internal transformation in IT at the time as well. And the company asked, hey, would you like to take all that you're doing with our external CIOs and bring that in house and look at, you know, how do we, how do we do this, our own type of transformation? Also what's going on? What should we be focused on in order to help drive the business? And this was back in a time when CIOs were looked at one of two lights, either they were there to keep the lights on and keep business running, or they were there to be a little bit more strategic and how do we help drive revenue? So Brent coming from my pre-sales perspective and sales orientation back into that, that realm allowed me to do that. But number two, and, and frankly, why I agreed to do it and what was so interesting for me is I spent most of my career 
and sales and or marketing aspects, like you said, really focus on go to market. We had just driven a go to market transformation. And I was really curious what it would be like to be on the side of the buyer. I wanted to understand what it was like to be sold to. I wanted to know what good looked like so I could then turn that around and take that back out to future sales organizations. Yeah, that's the bit that I think would attract me is you get the chance to learn from the other side. You get the chance to feel the different pressures and the different uh, dynamics of of being in that role. And I bet that was a fascinating learning for you, um, that part of your career. It was fascinating. And it was interesting because I would sit in meetings with my largest vendors. And I remember at the time thinking, are they using solution selling on me? Did they just go challenger sales on me? So it's interesting. You could start to pick up those nuances of the selling models and methodologies as you're now being sold to. It's very, very enlightening. That is enlightening. And in fact, since you bring up challenger, when you left Extreme, you went to be a couple of roles at Cineverse, but the latter one was the head of global sales SEs and also sales acceleration. And I noticed there down in the bullets was you rolled out the challenger sales methodology at Cineverse. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, and interesting. And and I I I'd followed a, a CRO mentor of mine over who I'd done a go to market transformation with before, which is you know, how we we kind of ended up together over there. A couple of key aspects of you know, rolling out the go to market transformation was ensuring our sales were using a consistent and cohesive sales methodology all across the globe. Right, very global organization, global customers, and rolling that out. And I think what was interesting to me is that. What we saw is that the SEs were just as integral as part of rolling out the challenger sales model as the rest of the sales organization. And in fact, sometimes, and of course, I'm partial to the SE world because it started there, but sometimes I would even say the SEs were more important in that challenger sales model because challenger sales says you have to teach your customer something, right? It's the whole teach, tailor, and take control. And we know a lot of times that conversation is happening especially in a technical sale environment, from the SC to the customer versus maybe the account executive or account manager to the customer as well. So very, very interesting uh, as we rolled that out, but very, very successful as well. Well, What was the impact? Were you able to measure it and and see what uh, it did for you? We were. We were able to measure the impact on both the the total um, sales duration or the average sales cycle, but also for us, what was most, most important was the average time it took us to have sales reps become productive once they onboarded, right? At the time we saw significant time around nine month sales productivity, and we were able to bring that down initially just after rolling that out down to six months. So a huge gain from that, but also shorten our sales cycles as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's such a huge impact. Wow, 30%, right? Um, decline in, uh, in, in ramp time. A lot of companies would wanna, wanna get that sort of result. Um, Absolutely. Let's fast forward to highest then. So. I'm going to ask this question in a, in a different way. Next month, uh, Mike, we've got RSA conference coming up. I know you guys are going to be there. Let's say I'm Andrew, the director of security at a medium-sized bank, and I walk up to your your booth and I say to one of your people on the team, uh, what does highest do? How do you want them to answer that question? Yeah, it's a great question. As you know, um, being in this industry for so long, um, it's, it's one of the most uh, interesting aspects of what we try to capture as a sales leadership is making sure we all answer that question, but answer it in a way that's consistent across the entire organization, not just sales, but, you know, product and engineering and everybody else. So, so my quick, you know, elevator pitch, if we've ever gone to, you know, overutilize that phrase is highest in the, is, is in the business of protecting businesses and solving intelligence problems through detection of adversary infrastructure and anomalous communication patterns. And to take that one step further is most cybersecurity companies, as you well know, and and your audience well knows, is their focus is blocking attacks on the way in. But we also know that that is not a valid approach when you think about things like zero day, you think about phishing attacks and others that are going to go in. So what we like to do is focus on once they're there, if if we assume that many attacks get there and they live dormant six, nine, 12 months and longer before anything happens. Then they go out and they start beaconing out and they start connecting and focus on command and control. That is the highest. That is what we focus on, is that we are the experts in understanding adversary infrastructure and those anomalous communication patterns when they start to beacon out 
to ask for instructions as to what do I do next and how do I launch this attack? Right. So the assumption is they're going to get in. You've know, you got to do the good hygiene, you know, all the things that the, the edge and on devices, all the rest of it should be there. But let's assume they get through because they do. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, the time to detect is probably the, the key metric to zero in on there. You know, people like to be low and slow, but uh, if you can detect them early, then you're significantly reducing their attack surface. So I got that about right? You got it. Exactly. I mean, the focus here is as soon as they start reaching out for that command and control infrastructure, as soon as they start reaching out, asking for instructions, we are there to identify that anomalous behavior and make sure it's known and either help the, help the uh, clients focus on how they remediate it or stop it, or um, just make sure that they're aware. And when I hear things like that, I, I immediately kind of go to threat intelligence as being a key part of this. Uh, what are the, without getting too technical, what are the other kind of elements that, that make up the solution? You're absolutely right. Um, threat intel is a huge aspect of where we like to focus, especially with you know, one particular aspect of our product line. Um, threat intel, the, uh, the infrastructure, and et cetera. But we also do um, some additional things to help protect the device and the network as well. So we can do this as a holistic point of view, but we can also do it independently at, on the device and the corporate network as well. Got it. Okay. And when I looked at your website, it looked like it was neatly packaged into different, there's like, I think, five products and a few, seven, eight solution areas. I'm kind of intrigued as a, as a startup, um, what that means for how you go to market and and how the, the marketing team and the sales team can communicate when you've got that many different aspects to what you do. Well, thank you. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm happy that you went, you, you went to our website and you were able to deduce kind of what we do. So that, that means something we're doing is working. So I appreciate that. Because um, as you know, as a startup, it's sometimes not easy to get that messaging out and to make sure that your, your clients and your prospects are taking away the message you want to. So we do have some key uh, elements of our product portfolio. We started out and focused on that threat intel side, something we call highest insight. It's really our bread and butter. It is our intellectual property. We've got a huge um, source uh, and a graph database, which allows us to have a data lake where we work with fraud, uh, threat, fraud, research teams, and so forth. But also leveraging that, we have things like highest protect and highest confront that allow us to focus on, again, like I mentioned before, the device and the network. However, to your point, where we go to and our ideal customer profile for each one of these can, can be a little bit differently, right? Who we focus on on the insight side, the data lake, where I mentioned around fraud and threat research teams is typically different than where we go and focus on from a cybersecurity point of view and the ideal persona when we talk about network and device with protect and confront. So it's a very different motion. And um, one thing that you'll, you'll see from our messaging is making sure we're talking to the right audience. And for the sales sellers going out there, are they going to different personas depending on the product? They, if they got one account, is it three? They got a target for completely different solutions? Or do they try and wrap it up together into more of a combined uh, approach? Yeah, great question. So so a, a couple aspects. One is we, we definitely do have a portfolio play. So we can go in and talk about you know, the platform as a whole and then how do we leverage each aspect of it. However, what we have found as we get into a client and we do have existing relationships with the clients, it's a little bit more prescriptive in who we talk to based on which solution and where they're focused. If we have a dedicated threat intel team, for example, we're generally going to focus on our, our insight with our data, our day lake graph database, and et cetera, versus a more typical you know, cybersecurity organization focused on security where we're going to go off and help them protect their devices in their network. Yeah, it must put an interesting stress, not stress, but it's a different challenge, right, for the, the sales team. And I guess the marketing team, when you're looking at messaging and, and who to target to figure out all this out, uh, especially you're, the you're startup, right. right? You don't have the luxury of, of you know, you're, you're, according to LinkedIn, you got about 55 people at, at, at highest. You know, I imagine some of your bigger competitors have 55 people in marketing. So, <laughs> so you've got to figure out how to do this with a lean team. That's exactly right. And, and frankly, one, one of our biggest focus is on our marketing side and how do we go to market is around ensuring that we make that messaging very crisp and understandable so that our sellers, it's easier for them to understand who they should be focusing on, who they should be talking to, and what the value proposition is that they should be leading with. When a, when a prospect uh, sees what you do, 
What is the wow moment for them? What's the thing where they go, oh, this is different. I haven't seen this before. I, I like the way you're doing that. I like your unique approach. What's that wow moment for them? Yeah, it's a combination of a few things. I mean, the first thing is the, you know, the expertise around adversary infrastructure. It's our ability to correlate all these many aspects of data that we bring in to our internal database. You know, there are a lot of companies out there that, that create a, a, a data set, if you will, but it's our connections, um, our relationships, and our resources and authoritative sources of this data that allows us to do this correlation. And it's the correlation where our prospects and our clients ultimately achieve that wow moment of, oh, I did not realize that once we correlate this data, we can now see what's beaconing out. We can now see not only what's beaconing out, but how it's connected to potentially other domains, other emails, and so forth. That's really going to give them the insight they need to go after and do the threat intel and the threat hunting they need to do. Mike, before we continue to talk about sales and go to market, let's learn a bit more about you. I've got, uh, I'm going to ask you to pick three numbers from one and 35. Uh, give me those and I'll read the corresponding questions. Certainly. That's probably going to be the, the easiest part of this conversation. So let's go with uh, three is one of my favorite numbers. Do you want me to give them all three of you at the same time or one let's at do, time? Let's do the first one. So three right. is, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, you know, throughout my career, um, done a lot of traveling, as many of us have in sales. Uh, my favorite place in the world is got to be absolutely Singapore. I, I love being in Singapore. I love the people, the culture, the food. I'm a huge foodie. I would, I would be there in a heartbeat. I gotta agree with you on the food. That whole Singapore, Malaysian, the the, yes. the Indian, the Chinese influences, in some ways the British influences, it creates a great food culture right there. Absolutely does. And then, like you said, um, the, the influence from Malaysia and others, just some of the most amazing sweet fruit I think you can get there, as well as just the rest of the cuisines from Asia. It's just amazing. Did you become a durian fan when you were in Singapore or not? That is the one thing I just can't get over. I just can't get past that smell. It's terrible. <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know, look up uh, Google Durian, D-U-R-I-A-N. And uh, I mean, there, this is one of those things where there's two types of people. One people that just can't stand it, and ones for some weird reason seem to love it. Uh, for me, it's just a disgusting smell and taste, but some people just think of a real delicacy and seem to love it. They really do. And, and, and there's one, one extra little tidbit there is there are many hotels there. They'll have a sign posted on the outside door that you're not even allowed to bring them inside the hotel. <laughs> That's great. Oh, uh, dear. Okay, one more number between one and 35. 33. 33. Tea or coffee? Uh, I'm a coffee drinker in the morning. I'm a tea drinker in the afternoon. Oh, gosh, you do both. That's awesome. Do both. And I have a, I have a mindset in my head. Once it hits noon, I'm not allowed to have any more coffee. I got to switch. I like that. Now, I, I was born and bred in the UK. So when people say tea, I think proper tea. You drink, you drink proper tea or are you a hyacinth and jasmine sort of guy? Um, I, I do it all. But again, based on my um, strong affinity with Asian culture, I love uh, green tea and um, oolong and other flavors of tea as well. Yeah, that green tea you get uh, there, it's its good stuff. It is amazing. All right, last number, team, one in 35. Uh, let's go with 15. 15 is, would you prefer a tricked out Jeep or German car with all the gadgets? Wow, that's a hard question because I've actually had and owned both. Um, <laughs> so I, I loved my Jeep. One of the things I've said, you know, as I've gotten older, it's um, a rough ride and not the most comfortable. And you definitely cannot do conference calls. It's too loud. So we're going to go with the German car. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have both right now or you've had both over time? I've had both over time. No longer have the Jeeps, have more of the cars. Okay. Yeah. Certain comfort to, <laughs> to exactly a, a nice exactly. car, right? And if that's the, the wow moment, how do you bring that as, as, cl as close to the start of the sales cycle or even in the marketing uh, that you're doing so people kind of get it as early as possible? Yeah, another phenomenal question. So obviously, like many you know, SaaS companies, you know, we are big believers in, in the demo um, and the proof of concept. We, we, like to, we like to say, you know, once you get on a demo with us, the wow moment will be there within the first five minutes because you're going to be able to see it. You're going to feel it. It's going to become very tangible. Um, you know, in our 
and our marketing aspects, it's really about our use cases and our case studies. We've got some phenomenal clients out there who are doing some amazing things. And we love to highlight that obviously where they allow us to, but we do some great work with some great organizations and our case studies really speak for themselves. That's cool. All right. What's the one question about highest that no one asks that they should really ask you about? Wow. Um, I've never had that one before. Um, the one question I would say is, um, why don't we know about you more? You know, why haven't we heard about you yet? And, um, you know, that's, that's many cybersecurity, many SaaS companies. You know, we are small, like you said, you know, around 50 or so people. Um, we just don't have the same size organization as others. So we are, we are very specific and very targeted in our approaches and to the types of clients and prospects we go after. We're not sending it out to the entire world. We're being very targeted and making sure we're going after exactly who we know is a perfect ideal customer profile for us and spending our cycles there. I, I like you said that. I mean, so according to LinkedIn, again, founded in 2015, so we're eight years on. Um, so still a startup mode, right? You're, you're small and nimble enough, but you can tell that you know, there's, there's 3,300 companies in cybersecurity right now. Everyone trying to get more than their fair share of attention. It's really difficult to do. And I think sometimes the temptation is, well, let's just go big and loud. And uh, in many ways, I think the more, I don't know, the more mature way to think about it is, well, how can we actually get very specific and get focused and, uh, and then be nimble if we have to be from there, right? Um, and, and, and get really good at one area before we get onto many. Um, I, I can imagine some companies blow a lot of budget and a lot of time trying to be too, too big. Uh, although I do, I do recommend to people to be bold. You, this is not the market you want to sit back and relax and hope people get what you do. And I, one of the things I loved about your website is it's different to other, like the traditional standard you know, technology website. There's, there's something different. As you look at it, my first impression was, huh, right? Now, this is different. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued, but what else is different about this now as I go into the words and, and some of the, the value props you're putting in there? So kudos to you for that. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, let's go back to November 2022. Uh, you joined Hias as the chief commercial officer. As you walked in the door and got going, get your feet under the desk and assess what was going on, what was the first thing that you had to work on? Yeah, so one of my first questions walking the door, and you know, my favorite relationship, you know, coming in as a sales leader or go-to-market leader, what have you, is with my operations team, right? Sales, rev ops, and so forth. And one of my first questions is, tell me our existing client base, because I want to understand where we've been successful. What are the target seg sectors and segments that we're selling into today so that we can go after and focus the rest of the organization, sales, marketing, everything we're doing around messaging, to make sure we're going after the right markets? So that was the first thing I did is really understand where we're successful today. What does our current client makeup look like? And can I, can I take away some important data points from that that allows us to build out our entire go-to-market messaging and strategy based on that? That was the first thing I did. And then what came after that? So after we've, we identified those target uh, verticals and sectors that we are you know, extremely successful at, which... Obviously, as you would expect, the data said it all. It showed it right there exactly where we're at. Was then, okay, now that we know that, let's make sure we align. We, we align our messaging. We build out our marketing organization and our marketing budget focused on making sure we know how to go after those. And then tying that back in on the go-to-market side, do we have the right selling model? Do we have the right sellers that understand those markets? And then do we have the right channel and partner motions? Have we set up the right relationships who are also focused on those verticals and sectors so that we have, I like to call it the marketing plumb line. I, I worked for an amazing CMO earlier in my career and she used to use that term all the time. The marketing plumb line is, you know, can, do we have the marketing go-to-market messaging framework at the top? And are we plumbed all the way down through the field? Do we have the right motions? Do we have the right messaging? Do we have the right channel partners and so forth? So that was phase two. And only after you do those first two can you decide what the organizational structure should be. You know, I think a lot of go-to-market leaders kind of flip that upside down and focus on the organizational structure first. And I think that's a fallacy. I don't think you I think you've really got to understand what you're solving for before you can decide what the right org structure to support that looks like. 
And you used the words transformation a few times in our discussion so far. Did you then have to make a transformation based on what you learned or, did, or, or was it all in the right uh, aligned perfectly? Well, you know, fortunate for us, we had some aspects of it that existed in the moment. I mean, we've got some amazing members of the team actually have the, the, the right people on the team where we had to focus on the transformation was making sure we were aligned, calling out those key verticals. You mentioned it in the beginning. As a startup, it's easy to try to be everything for everyone. We were also a victim of that as well. So we decided, okay, we're going to go focus on these four verticals. Do we have the right organizational structure to support those four verticals? Do we have the right messaging and aspects in our marketing plan and budget to support those? So we had to do a few minor tweaks and adjustment. But the good news for us is we had the right people on the team. That's great. That's great. And how much of an advantage was it to be chief commercial officer where you're doing marketing and sales as you're trying to get the alignment throughout a transformation? Absolutely huge, uh, huge advantage. And it's frankly one of the reasons why you know, this role was so appealing to me is it wasn't just you know, the sales and marketing, but also the client experience side you know, that I've got responsibility for. So understanding our, client, our current clients, understanding our engagements with them, understanding why they're so successful with us, taking that over to our marketing and our sales teams, and then leveraging, as I mentioned, you know, my sales and revenue ops. Now bring us those data and those insights together to help us really drive the decision-making and the strategy. To me, that is the perfect scenario. And that's why we're sitting here today where I would say extraordinarily successful, doing the right activities, going into conference season with RSA next month, as you mentioned. I'm really excited about what the future has to hold for us. Do you think we'll see more chief commercial officers like that with sales and marketing under them? Or is this a bit of an anomaly, do you think? No, I think we're going to see more, especially in smaller, more nimble startups, right? You, you've got to have that alignment and around, and you hear me say it all throughout our conversation on go to market. Go to market isn't a sales driven motion. Go to market is a sales, marketing, client experience. It's a whole company motion. And I think this role is becoming increasingly important in these smaller, more nimble organizations where you've got that, you know, the CEO's got one throat to choke, right? And that's me. He knows who's responsible for making sure our marketing is tied to our sales and partner motions. It's also tied to our client experience at the end of it. That's got to be aligned and tied together. And I think this role is becoming increasingly important. I wonder why more companies don't do it. Yeah, I, I've been wondering the same thing. You know, it's, it's one of the things that came out. I, and you see it even some of the larger organizations, say, in the tech community are starting to roll out chief commercial, chief customer, and those other types of roles who are also have uh, responsibility for the go-to-market. But I think you're going to see a lot more of it. Well, let's focus on the, the sales side for just now. Tell us about the, the sales team that you've, you've created. Yeah, so we've got uh, two primary motions, right? We've got our, our direct sales team focused on going after our direct uh, end-user accounts, focused on making sure that we're focusing on some of our larger opportunities, our larger engagements that align to those verticals. We've also got a dedicated partner team and they're focused on making sure we're going out and building out those right relationships, whether that's from a traditional you know, value-added reseller, VAR and reseller, or more on the consulting side, or even doing more around uh, integrations as well. So they're out focused on that. We've got you know, white-label OEM focus, and we are fortunate enough to have some, some customers there that are focused on the, the white-label side. Um, and then we've also got you know, around you know, marketing, how do we do that demand lead generation, that lead flow, also have a dedicated SDR team as well so we can make sure we're focusing on creating those inbounds, those outbounds, and the de demand and lead generation. I'm just curious on the partner side, are there any specific types of resellers or uh, SIs or whatever that it really you're, you're doing well with? Yeah, uh, I love that question. And it's something we had to take a look, look back on, right, and make sure... Partner, to me, the partner go-to-market is no different than the sales go-to-market, which is we have to make sure we understand the right ideal customer profile, our ideal partner profile, to make sure that they understand and they're aligned to our business. Where we've seen where we've been very successful is those partners in that channel team that security is imperative to their business. One of the first questions I like to ask to any potential partner is, how do you look at your year-over-year -year growth? And what's going to drive your growth? 
if it's going to be security or is it infrastructure or is it their services, what's important to them to drive their business? If cybersecurity is an aspect of them that drives their business growth year over year, then that's a partner we want to talk to. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, you know, as I talk to sales teams uh, in what I do, usually the number one challenge that they have is, is, is pipeline, <laughs> pipeline generation. Um, I'm wondering what you've learned and what you're doing that's, that's successful for you in that area. Yeah, so, and you're absolutely right, right? Pipeline generation is, you know, I, I like to say it's the, the, outside of CRM, it's the bane of most salespeople's existence, right? Is, you know, pipeline, as sales leaders, we're all saying you need three to five X pipeline. And they're all saying, I need to close deals. And, I, you know, my pipeline, where am I getting it from marketing? What's the rest of the company doing for me from a pipeline point of view? Um, you know, one of the things we do is, is again, when we switched our go-to-market and as we led through this transformation is really taking a look at what marketing's contribution to sales and revenue is so that we understand what that pipeline generation and contribution can be. So we have done a lot on the marketing side to generate, whether it's through webinars, whether it's through events. We've got some amazing um, researchers on our team um, within the highest organization, within highest labs. That allows us to really come out with some expertise. Um, and we're really leveraging some of that now as well to help drive some of the demand generation and ultimately create some pipeline. But frankly, the other side of that, where I think is often underutilized, is asking for referrals or references from your existing clients. They are the best spokesperson of what we do. Um, our, we're very fortunate. Our clients absolutely love us. And so getting them, the cybersecurity community, as many companies as there are, the community itself is pretty small. So getting them to talk and be an advocate on your behalf is one of the, the best pipeline generators out there. And is there anything you do from a program standpoint to do that, or you leave it up to the team to do it on their own? Um, so we actually do have a program uh, focused on with our client experience team, who um, also has some focus on not just making sure our existing clients understand the benefit that they're getting from utilizing our products and services, but also when we do you know, quarterly business reviews with them, when we're doing reviews with them to make sure that the products are working to their satisfaction, we're also doing the same thing at the same time, which is looking for opportunities to get introduced, whether it's in within the same organization, other organizations, a conference that they happen to be going to, a conference that they're speaking at, you know, leveraging that so we can do introductions and meet and greets based on, on those conversations. Oh, that's great. I think it's one of these things that, uh, you know, it comes up with a QBR, internal QBR. Oh, we need to get some more referrals. Then everyone goes, yes, we'll get some more referrals. And then, you know, someone sends a couple of emails and then it seems to usually die, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm always intrigued about how someone's making this into more of a program, more of a process that actually people follow through on, as opposed to the, the thing that gets forgotten about in the plane home. Like That's right. Know. Well, another thing that we've done that's a little bit, um, I don't want to say unique, but it's different. I haven't seen it in a lot of organizations is our client experience team, our client success team, you know, they've also got a number tied to them for cross-sell and upsell. So because they've also got that in there is they're constantly looking for opportunities to make sure that we're helping our clients in the best way possible. Yes, they may be a user of one of our solutions today. They could potentially add, get added value by another one. So it's something that they want to make sure that they're working with their direct sales team on. It's a combined effort. And so they've got skin in the game on that as well. That's great. Um, kind of related question, I guess, is, uh, you know, as you're, as you're putting the new go-to-market structure in place and, uh, you know, getting everyone trained up and thinking about what you want them to be working on, how are you thinking about building the playbook for the sales team? Is it something formal? And if so, how do you enable that? Yeah, that's actually the next phase of kind of where we're going, right? So we started out by understanding what key verticals and key segments we needed to be in, right? Understanding our segments. Number two, understand what our go-to-market motion should be, both uh, direct and partner. But now we're on to the next phase, which is now that we've got the org structure settled, which is how do we train and enable our entire go-to-market organization, not just our sellers, but our marketing team, our SDRs, everybody. So now we're looking at what is what is the approach? Um, we just did uh, re recently, uh, we rolled out MedPick for our um, organization, our sales methodology. So we've rolled that out. We're in the process of now tying that back into our CRM tool, which we're in the process of doing now. The next phase of that is going into the formal uh, training program, which we'll do. So we launched it at a uh, sales kickoff earlier this year. 
We're going into a more formal training program so that we, as we onboard new sellers into the organization, as we onboard new folks into even product team, we're all getting the same amount of training and um, information and flow through. But in the interim, we've launched our internal uh, pre-sales engineering team has launched a, a, a weekly sales training to the entire company to teach them on how we're, what types of client engagements we're getting into, what kind of conversations we're getting into, the types of questions that our clients are asking us so that we can bring that back to the organization as a whole. And, and why did you assign that to the pre-sales team? Uh, because I love the team, as I mentioned. But no, um, you know, we are a very technical team. Uh, we've, we, uh, I'm very fortunate. We've got some amazing folks on the team. You know, my SE leader is, um, you know, an expert in this, in this field and in cybersecurity comes from a security operations center himself. So he understands both sides of it, right, from the vendor side, but also the operational side. And I wanted him to be able to take out that real world experience as it relates to what we're here to solve for, for our, the industry and for our clients. No, I like that. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing for your sales team right now, overnight, that's bugging them or holding them back, what would you wave that wand at? Out, outside of pipeline? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's the, I think the biggest thing that we get asked uh, asked about all the time, and I'm sure you hear it all the time as well, and even our advisory board said this to us when we had a conversation with them recently is, tell me really quickly how you're different from every other cybersecurity organization out there and why or how are you going to make my life easier? And to be able to have that for your entire go-to-market organization at, at one, you know, we all sit back and say that should be the easiest thing we do. But unfortunately, that is very difficult because we all have, we, we all like to tell stories a little bit differently. We all like to have our own version of a story. So having that cohesive thing, you can go up to a CISO or a CIO, head of security, head and threat intel, and say, here's how we're different. Here's how you can leverage us. And here's the value you're going to gain just by talking or learning more about us is a very um, difficult proposition. It is difficult, but it's so important. And, you know, going back to RSA coming up in a month, I mean, you know, I'm surprised actually how few vendors are there officially at the show. There's about, I think, 300, 350 will be there, which is about 10% of the market. But even then, you know, walking around the booth, I mean, it is the, the, what do you do and how are you different are the, the two questions that everyone wants answers to. And exactly uh, right. knowing how to just very clearly be able to say that so someone goes, oh, I get it, as opposed to what often happens is, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I have no idea what you said and why are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> Let's flip things around, Mike. Um, do you have a question for me that might be relevant for your business? Absolutely. I, I appreciate that, Andrew. So, you know, what's what's always on top of my mind, um, and, and you've got a lot of experience, and you talk to people all the time, you spend a lot of time in career and cybersecurity. So based on that experience in cybersecurity, how are you seeing the buyer landscape change or evolve? And specifically, are you seeing the buying decision team change and who we should be kind of targeting our messaging to? Um, well, I think the obvious uh, answer is yes, it's changed a lot. <laughs> you know, over the last, you know, pick any period of time, the last five years, 15 years, 20 years, it's definitely moved away from a, a leader making a decision and then you know, somewhat involved in their team and then moving forward uh, into much more of the committee, the wider roles are involved. One of the things I think is interesting, actually, the challenger sale, the challenger sale was good about thinking about seller, sellers and sales reps. The challenger customer is probably the one I think that has the most impact for teams if they embrace that idea. And that's the idea that, you know, a lot of deals die between first engagement and then that person inside the company trying to get the right people involved and also a board on board to making a change. And some of the things that they, they do inside the challenger customer help, you know, figure out who the right people are that truly can make that change internally. And I don't know what the number is these days, whether it's seven or 7.9 or 10.2 or whatever the size of the buying team. It is a lot though, right? Wow. Uh, so I think that's, that's the kind of obvious thing. I think the interesting thing that's happened though in the last few years is that uh, it's not just within security or networking. These were the kind of classic two areas where security decisions were made. And now it goes into all sorts of different areas. You just look at the, the, the 
um, growth in startups in the uh, secure development lifecycle kind of model, the shift left movement, right? Suddenly you're in a world where you got to work with developers and security folks, right? Um, or you're looking at SASE and, and Surface Edge that goes from security into edge networking, uh, internal networking, the whole thing. There's different teams involved all the way through. So the challenge for the sales team and the marketing team is, well, how do you then go and engage with people, right? And I always feel like you've got to figure out um, who's the person that is intrigued enough to then look out from inside their organization to go and try and find a solution. And that's probably the, the right person to start with when you're thinking about, as you said, focusing your message. There's lots of people that, that might do it, but more often than not, who's that one person who has it on their mind, should have it on their mind, and then they're the person who becomes the, um, you know, the, the mobilizer inside the company to then draw in the, the right people in the right different departments. I think that's the bit that's kind of hard, right? You got to say, right. well, you know, every deal is different, and this one started over here, and that one started over there, and that's where, as you were saying, look at your rev ops folks and say, well, let's actually dissect some of these down and say, where do we first get engaged? Be able to say that's the person to go after. I would. What, what's interesting is that. Um, you know, companies that have done this well, I, I, you know, the shift left is one thing. Uh, look at CrowdStrike, right? So CrowdStrike's message right from the start was, you know, we stop breaches, right? It was a very security-orientated, risk management-orientated message. But what they were doing behind the scenes is they had a very strong selling motion into the business justification side. So going into higher-level people and engaging the, the finance folks attached to IT to say, look, there's a real strong business case to make this change. And they engaged some, you know, value, um, value model type companies, or I think one company, uh, to help them make that kind of business oriented selling selling motion. But their prime one is the first one in was through the, you know, we stop breaches. And I think it's always been like that all the way through. I think the one exception to this, Mike, though, is is those companies that um really figure out the PLG side. Is you you can tell the PLG companies because their their call to action on the page is not schedule a meeting or schedule a demo. It's free trial. <laughs> so their, their their message is down the stack, right? It's more technical orientated. And it's like download my stuff and try it is what they're trying to get people to do. Um, and that's if, if you're, you know, if people are thinking about PLG, you gotta figure out that bit right there rather than worrying about, you know, who else might be in the buying committee. So I don't know if that's what how you think about it or even, you know, where you were going with the question, but hopefully that's a little bit helpful. No, that's extraordinarily helpful. And I, I love a couple of your references there because, you know, uh, the executive leadership team and I, even just as recently as a week or so ago, have been having this conversation around product versus sales led growth and, you know, where we should be focusing on. And you're going to see some interesting things from Hyas at RSA in just a few weeks where we're going to be announcing some things very, very aligned to what you just mentioned around PLG. Um, and others. So, um, you know, be on the lookout for that. But you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the buying decision team is changing. It's evolving. And frankly, um, I, could even, I would even argue based on which aspect of cybersecurity you're looking at, it's even specific within that. Um, so making sure that we understand how we message to it, but also how we sell to it and how we have a conversation to it, which I think makes the job of our sellers even that much more difficult than it has in the past. Because like you said, you know, I, I come from a network infrastructure background. We knew exactly who you needed to talk to, the network infrastructure team. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's very different now. And then you talk about cybersecurity insurance. And, you know, one of the aspects we do, protective DNS, is starting to get brought up in that even more and more. So it's no longer just about security. There's also conversations to be had with internal legal teams and internal audit teams to make sure that you're aligned back to your example with CrowdStrike. So very much aligned. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you know, as a seller, you you have to be, I, I always think you have to be an expert in in one area. Like you have to be an expert engaging with director of threat intelligence, let's say, and that team that goes around it. But you need to be conversant to, to go wider than that. I think the challenge that uh, I haven't seen too many companies really figure out is is when their, their products demand they be experts to multiple different types of buyers. Like if you're looking for someone who's going to be the expert security seller, but also the network, uh, the expert network mm -hmm. infrastructure seller. Not many people seem to be able to make that that transition. What they do is a little bit of resistance in the area that they're they're not used to. They go back in their shell to say, "Well, 
I kind of know this, the security folks. Let me just keep going over there. That's I know I shouldn't do it. I know I'd probably limit myself, but this is where I'm more comfortable and I seem to get more traction. That's exactly right. Well, we all have a tendency, right? As sellers, as SEs, we all have a tendency to navigate where is either is easiest for us or we have the most amount of um, interest, right? It's where we go and focus on. So you're right. If if I, I mean, if I, if I'm a network infrastructure guy, then it's going to be much easier for me to go have a conversation, relate to them, versus if I'm a network infrastructure who's then moved over into security and other aspects of the business. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Well, listen, Mike, I really enjoyed the conversation today. Good, uh, good transformations. It sounds like going on at highest that you're you're working through as the chief commercial officer. If someone wants to get in touch to either continue the conversation or perhaps want to be part of that transformation, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Reach out. Um, I love to connect on LinkedIn. It's you know it's the the platform where we all connect and look at um, where we're heading to next. You know, I like to post out there. We're headed to RSA and then some other conferences coming up next. Um, but also, uh, you can reach me uh, email Michael Barker at highest dot com. Well, that's great. Listen, I, I wish you every success for RSA for twenty three and into next year as well. Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate the conversation. It was a pleasure meeting you. Well, that was Mike Barker, the Chief Commercial Officer at HIAS. What a treat that was to chat to him about what they've got going on there and uh, what he's been leading since he joined a few months back. It's a bunch of takeaways, I'm sure. Three for me. One was our quick discussion around the idea of this Chief Commercial Officer. You know, it, it seems to make sense in smaller companies to have that as a combined role leading sales and marketing. Interesting trend to look out for. I could see why in some cases and also with some people, it might not be the right fit for them and they, they really need to specialize either in sales or in marketing, but it must be a compelling case for companies as they're getting going to have someone who oversees both functions. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the coming years. I really liked his idea of what he's talked about with the marketing plumb line. And uh, you know, plumb line that runs through go to marketing, go to market. You know, marketing and sales, thinking about the whole funnel. Is everything aligned around this plumb line that, that hangs down? Um, and, you know, I think we've all seen this, right? Where as, as you've got different people, different groups, as you get different ideas, suddenly the, the, what should be a straight plumb line is a zigzag way down through the funnel. Different messages, maybe things that were older that we haven't updated yet. Things like that where what should be a straightforward, straight line is not like that. So as a, as a visual, it made a ton of sense to me to say that uh, we, sh you know, companies should be thinking about how do they make sure they have that aligned all the way through the different functions, all the way through the funnel, everything that a prospect or a customer sees and touches. So that was one takeaway. And finally, I really liked what he said when I asked him about the, the wow moment, right? How, if I'm a customer, when do I get that moment where it's like, wow, that I see how you guys are different. And what he said was inside the five minutes of the first five minutes of the demo is where someone should see that. And it becomes obvious about why IS is different to everyone else that they're competing with in the market. I think that's a great thing to take away. Too often what we do is kind of leave it up to chance a little bit that a prospect is going to A, know that was the wow moment and why we're different. Or secondly, we leave it to too late in the process. Sometimes at the end of the first meeting, end of the demo, even in the second meeting, that's way too late. It's something that we should be leading with and thinking about how we engineer meetings around the wild moment so that the people that we're talking to have a much better chance of remembering who we are and why we're different. Because with 3,300 companies in cyber, that's not easy to get to. So I like what uh, Mike was saying about the team being able to deliver that wild moment super early on in the demo. So that was my three takeaways. I'm sure you've got uh, either same or different ones to that. There was a lot Mike talked about there that I thought was really interesting. And uh, I wish the Tim and the team every success for RSA for 2023 and beyond.